Savannah Guthrie on the floor uh, in the Texas delegation and uh, and somebody that she she reached uh, sort of summed this up. It's Christmas. I think I think there's some things you can't see on television, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the. Uh, and maybe the great thing about conventions that still make sense, even when some of this has now become somewhat uh, pro forma, you, you, you bust your hump to get elected delegate. You gotta go out and work for it. You gotta spend your hours and hours and hours of going around canvassing, doing the job, fundraising. It's a big deal to get your foot in the door. And then you look forward to this trip, but I guess you pay for most of it yourself. And you get out here to a city like this, and it's all hoopla and everybody likes each other and you stay out late and you, some people get a little hungover sometimes and they have a good time. And I tell you, these Democrats have especially good time. There's a cultural <laughs> difference, I gotta tell you. I've been to a lot of conventions. And Democrats get a lot more loosey-goosey when it comes to these events. And there won't be weeping next week in St. Well, Paul when, when Mr. McCain and, is nominated. And I know that we have, as journalists, the job of saying, why are you emotional? Well, duh. <laughs> they just nominate the person they spend months and months, in a couple of cases, a couple of years getting nominated. It's finally happened. They realized that this war, and it was a war. Everybody's saying that we put it up. There was a war going on here is settling down to the point where there's harmony. And I'll tell you, I mean, I've made some statements in the last couple of months that some people don't like on the Clinton side. Fair enough, I'm a commentator. Some people don't like anything I say, fair enough. But nobody's come up to me and said, I don't like what you say. Plenty of opportunity, I gotta tell you. And so what I think's going on is, you come out here to Denver, and the weather's pretty nice, and you get to blow off your steam, and then you feel better. And then you have a peace treaty, you smoke the peace pipe, and it works. And that's what democracy is all about. It's what, by the way, people like Bush think it's so easy to teach. It's very hard to teach this. It took the British, what, 200 years well, to teach it to the Indians. Everybody has to do it their way. It's hard. But this particular lesson has not been taught before. The particular person at the end of that story that you just told, which right. is fitting, but somewhat embedded in our history. This is a new conclusion to that story. This is an African-American right. man nominated by one of the leading parties in the Western world to lead the government of the country. This has not happened. We have done this, and uh, whether you're going to sit there and vote and do everything you can against Obama's candidacy or for it, this is the historic moment here, as much as anything to come will be historic. And uh, so, you know, it, there's an extra answer to the to the duh part. Yes, it's it's relief, it's achievement. It's an achievement larger than the, the efforts of any of the of the delegates, an achievement of, of the process. And as we were saying last night, we could not have foreseen this moment three years ago, four years ago. It was it was still something to aspire to in the future. That a woman or an African American or another minority group would be represented at the top of a ticket and with an excellent chance at, at, at least to be president of the United States. Our, Archbishop Tutu of South Africa, who went through the hell of the, yes. ring, of the, of the rings of fire and the horror of apartheid and the effort to bring down apartheid, he said something that I thought was so valuable to us, and he's an outsider, he's been to America so many times, he said, when he came to America in the 70s for the first time, he couldn't believe how much frustration there was from African-American men he knew, who felt, even though it was on the books, civil rights, and even though the, they, you know, the, the law said no discrimination, that they were up against reality. And, uh, especially, and women, of course, feel that as much today in many ways. And so it's not that we've ended the struggle for equality in terms of ethnicity or race or gender, but in the face of the continuing struggle, there's been this achievement. And it could have been an achievement for a woman. That's what's happened here. Not that a, an African-American kid in a tough neighborhood right now doesn't have it really tough. It's that in the face of that reality, this has happened. And that's what Tutu said. And it's not happened anywhere else. Not in France or Russia or London or any of the Latin America. A guy from a different ethnic group, an African-American in this case, has come on against the current history and has done this. That's what's astounding. That's why people are crying. It is a singular moment for us at a nation, both those of us who are, who are here and those who went before and, and those who will come afterwards. This was a, a milestone right here, and moments throughout this campaign seemed ready to sabotage either of the, of the achievements that could have come on this day. Whether it had been Senator Clinton winning in the primaries, and this had been the first prominent uh, party to nominate a woman in this country, uh, or if it had been, as it turned out, Senator Obama. Either way, 
not only is there one accomplishment, but obviously, with the closeness of the race and the fact that, that both of these individuals were central, were the two central players in this campaign, were a woman and an African American. That one won does not mean the other one lost and the whole right. cause is gone forever. That door will come down too. There will be a woman president of the United States. That's what we saw in addition to the fact that there is now an African American candidate for president of the United States. Two doors came down. They can join those two things together in this unity mo movement that began here in Denver or solidified here in Denver, and they hope will carry them to the White House in, uh, in November. As you said last night, that is the condition of victory. If Barack Obama fails beginning tomorrow night to carry the baton of women's equality forward in a way that Hillary Clinton was carrying it so historically, he will fail to win in November because the deal here is that he comes out of this convention carrying the cause of Hillary Clinton as well as his own cause. That's the marriage, I shouldn't say the marriage, that's the compact right. that's coming out of here, the compact of Denver. Let's, uh, let's bring our special correspondent, Tom Brokaw, from the uh, Pepsi Center in on this conversation. And the, uh, it, it is imperative to underscore how important a moment this is, is it not, Tom? It really is, Keith. I just ran into uh, a woman I know outside, Ann Fudge, who is a very prominent African-American executive, and she uh, just had a brief emotional meltdown saying, my God, can you believe that this is happening? And I, and I said to her, there is a kind of surreal quality about it yet. I think we'll see it more tomorrow night, obviously, when Barack Obama appears at the football stadium before 70,000 fans. and a whole lot of the world tuning in on that as well. But it is a commentary, however it turns out, and however you feel about his candidacy, about America finally beginning to come to grips with the complexity of the racial issues that have beleaguered us for so long. This is a huge step. It's a big generational step. We've been talking about it here for some time. The difference between the new generation of young professionals who are out there who are doctors and lawyers and people who went to Harvard and served in the state legislature, now one of them is a candidate for president of the United States, officially nominated by the Democratic Party 40 years after Dr. King was gunned down in Memphis, Tennessee. It is a moment to remember. And the senator from Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar, made a great reference. Obviously, it is uh, uh, wonderful to be uh, joining this historically with Martin Luther King's speech, but it's also terrific that she brought in Hubert Humphrey's name and the fact that 60 years ago when he spoke out for what, yeah. what, what now looks like just the, the base minimum of civil rights in this country set off uh, an, almost an apocalypse in American politics. Uh, it, it, I thought it was terrific that, that uh, Hubert Humphrey's name was invoked today. Well, it, it, it very appropriately should have been, uh, because, in fact, he did force this party to begin to confront the hypocrisy of racism. And as you know, when Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, it was widely reported he said, there goes the South, but at the same time, he thought the Voting Rights Act would raise the population of African Americans who would now be able to go to the polls. There's an interesting movement underway, by the way, led by Andrew Young called Why Tuesday, because he continues to believe, as do a lot of others, mm -hmm. that we've now got to change the voting day so that more people uh, who have to work two jobs, for example, can get to the polls. If they can't on Tuesday, why not move it to a weekend and expand it? That's the next thing that we'll be hearing. We are in a, in a period of some, I, I think, significant tectonic plates moving in American politics here tonight. Tom, uh, when you look at the delegations out there, can you see uh, November? Can you see where it's headed? The, Tim, our late colleague, used to be so great at uh, identifying ahead of time the, uh, the key states, the point of conflict, the midnight, the two in the morning uh, tallies that will uh, decide the election. Do you get a sense yet of where this is going to end up? Well, Tim and I talked a lot before we lost him about the Rocky Mountain West, and it wasn't just because I happened to be inclined toward this geography. 
what I thought beginning shortly after four years ago was the enormous transition that this region is undergoing. Colorado is a perfect example of that. So is Nevada. New Mexico is still in play. You're seeing the investment that Barack Obama is making in Montana. Those will come later on election night, and they can very well determine who wins this election. Uh, now, John McCain has got deep roots in the Southwest, beginning in Arizona, and if he picks Milt Romney, uh, if he picks Mil Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney, who obviously has a very strong ties to Utah, but can appeal to those conservative social values of the West as well. I think that this region is going to be in play as it has not been in my lifetime, Chris. So it's New Mexico, it's Colorado, it's Nevada, even the state you're very familiar with, Montana, and uh, perhaps even what, North Dakota? Is that on the list? It is on the list, and North Dakota has that interesting political history. It was a very radical state, as you know, in the 1930s. It still has two Democratic senators, Dorgan and Conrad. Uh, Barack Obama spent the 4th of July there. They feel that they've got a real shot at it. There was even some talk about my old home state of South Dakota being in play, although the folks that I'm talking to up there say that's probably a reach for Barack Obama. Uh, Senator McCain, curiously enough, does not have any offices uh, of any significance, I'm told, in Montana. And the Republican Party in Montana is in, if not in shambles, it's in kind of disheveled shape. So I think Barack Obama probably has an opportunity to go there. We have to say all this with the conditioning that we've got a long way to go. We're now, of course, in the heat of the moment at the Democratic Convention. Next week, things will look a lot brighter for the Republicans when we, when they, as we expect that they will, stage their own convention in a, con in a convincing fashion. Tom Brokaw, many thanks. We'll be back to you uh, in a bit. Let's just get one piece of business here, in case you're wondering. Uh, although Barack Obama has accepted the nomination, he will not be considered officially the nominee until the conclusion of his acceptance speech. So he's not, he's in that twilight zone now between being <laughs> accepting the nomination and not really being the nominee. Chris? We'll hold our applause. Yeah. Uh, let's go right now to David Gregg, who's down on the floor with one of the real heroes of the civil rights movement. In fact, the last survivor of the great uh, Martin Luther King occasion back in 1963, John Lewis. Chris, thanks very much. Uh, I am wedged in the Georgia delegation with Congressman Lewis. Congressman, uh, explain this moment. As a young man, you, you put your life on the line to get human rights for African Americans, and here you stand with an African American man about to become the nominee of this party. What's it like? Well, it's unreal. It's unbelievable. Uh, today, I, I cried a little earlier today. I cried on Monday night, and uh, I don't think I have any more tears. Uh, this is one of the most amazing and unbelievable moment in my life. Uh, I think about the struggle of so many people, those people who stood in unmovable lines trying to register to vote. I think about the young people that were killed in Mississippi in 1964, individuals like Martin Luther King Jr. and others, the people who tried to pass the so-called literacy test. And, you know, it all is saying now nah, it was worth it. It was worth the struggle. And what we did tonight is another down payment on the fulfillment of the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. This is political theater. The outcome was not in doubt, but to have Senator Clinton have this unity movement marked off with such drama, why did this convention and this party need this moment tonight? Well, it was very important for Senator Clinton to do what she did last night and to come back tonight and do it in a much more unbelievable way. It's in the strongest possible message to all Democrats that we are together and we're going to go out and fight the fight and take this campaign to the people in America. Can you describe your own evolution in this campaign as a Clinton supporter, uh, a stalwart ally of the Clintons, and then at some point you sensed that this moment of history that brought you to tears was upon you when perhaps you didn't think it was realistic. Can you take me through that? Well, I've been known the Clintons for a long time. Uh, President Clinton has been like a brother. And I've known uh, Hillary Clinton, been my friend for many, many years. And they're still friends of mine. 
and I supported them in the very beginning. And along the way, I saw something happening. I had what we call an executive session with myself. And I said what Barack Obama is doing is akin to the movement, to what we were fighting for, struggling for. And I said to myself, I want to be on the right side of history. And I made the decision to change and commit to Barack Obama. What can Bill Clinton do for Barack Obama tonight that you and others would like to see him do? Well, I think President Clinton uh, must come in here tonight and, and knock it out of the park the same way that his wife did. Uh, he must come in here and embrace Barack Obama and not only embrace him and the Democratic Party, but say with Barack Obama, you will have the presidency similar to his. We had economic growth. We had peace during the presidency of Bill Clinton. We created more than 20 million new jobs. Barack Obama can do the same. And President Clinton must say that and state it and get out there and campaign with Barack Obama. Finally, for any African-American leader in 2008 to be the heir to all of the good fortune and all the struggles that, that you and others have bequeathed to him is a heavy burden. And yet in this campaign, race is not necessarily central to his candidacy. Is that what pleases you most? Is that what you wanted to have happen? Uh, I, I'm more than gratified, more than happy to see the large number of people, young people, people of middle age, older people that are not African American, they're white. Young white people saying to their fathers and mothers, saying to their grandfathers and grandmothers, you must support Barack Obama. Barack Obama is African American, but he's not an African American candidate. He's the Democratic nominee for the presidency. And that's an important, it's an important it's, distinction. It's very important. Uh, this man is the personification of the best of America. This can only happen in America. You have to think back to moments when you were literally bloodied in your fight for, for human rights and then look around this floor and uh, see the, 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 the swaying back and forth and the calls for unity and the raw emotion on the floor to have a woman get 18 million votes and to have an African-American candidate who is the, the nominee of this party. But you look, you look at the makeup of this convention, it looked like America. We are black, we are white, we're Latinos, we're Asian American, we're Native American, we're young, we're old, we're rich, we're poor. We are Americans. And that's what the struggle was all about. To create one America, one house. And that's what Barack Obama the carrier to the American people. Now you move on from the convention. Barack Obama moves on with all of this sense of unity. Is America ready? to elect an African-American as president? America is ready. As Michelle said the other night, it is time for us to stop doubting and start dreaming. We must make the dream real. We must make it real. And I think it will become real. All right, Congressman Lewis, thank you very much. We gotta go back outside to Keith. Pretty interesting life because David Gregory, Congressman Lewis, uh, greatest thanks. Uh, we're going to bo go back down to the floor. Uh, the, the, the instructions are a little garbled here. Andrea Mitchell, I believe, is uh, we're calling in Andrea on the floor uh, of the convention center. Andrea. Hey, thanks, Keith. I'm here on the floor in the New York delegation with Chuck Schumer. There was just all the excitement that you saw as Hillary Clinton came here. You were with her and through this process. How hard was it for her? She looked like she was really into it. You know, it is so hard for her because look how close she came. Look how historic it all could have been and really was anyway. But Hillary Clinton, and people don't give her enough credit for this, always does the right thing. She, has, she knew that the right thing to do was not just perfunctorily go through the motions, but be enthusiastically for Barack, and that's how she feels. Is there disappointment deep inside her if you did an x-ray? Of course. But she's going to do the right thing, and it's not just today. It's going to be through November 4th. Now, she obviously has shown that she's a team player. Is this partly to ensure her own political future? Nobody can say she was a sore loser. 
Nobody can say she's a sore loser simply because she's not. And you know, I think lesser people would have pouted or gone part of the way. She went all the way for Barack. Speaking of people who've been pouting, what about Bill? He's coming tonight. What do you know about the speech? We hear all sorts of reports that he wants to redeem himself for his legacy. He feels he was unfairly portrayed as a racist during the primary campaigns. Uh, how much are we going to hear about John McCain tonight? I think we're going to hear a lot about John McCain because nobody, nobody I think in this country is better at pointing out the foibles of the John McCain Bush policies than Bill Clinton. And I'll tell you something else. He knows the best thing that he can do for himself is give a very strong speech. So I think just as you saw Hillary go the whole way, so will President Clinton. And people are going to love his speech. And afterwards, I think they're going to be saying he really did the job for Barack. Okay. Thank you very much, Chuck Schumer. And Keith, we talk about history. David just interviewed John Lewis, who is uh, an icon in the civil rights history. This, this Democratic Party has just nominated the first African-American to be the Democratic nominee, uh, the nominee of a major party. Can't talk about more history than that. But in New York, uh, they've, they've come across, and Hillary Clinton believes what she did tonight will help bring other women across, other of her women supporters. Chuck, I mean, Chris and Keith. Andrea, thank you uh, from the floor of the convention center. Uh, we're going to go to Chris in just a moment, but there's a little bit of news relating to what Bill Clinton is going to do later in the evening at about 9 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, Ten minutes has been allotted to the former president to speak about Senator Obama. Uh, we'll see if that uh, that deadline is is uh, is met. Uh, there is some guidance from aides to the Clinton campaign saying that in his primetime speech, the former president will argue forcefully that Senator Obama is prepared for the domestic, foreign, and national security challenges that will arise in the coming years. In other words, a complete reversal of the Clinton campaign line of early in the primary season that he would not be ready on day one. Apparently, one of the focuses of Bill Clinton's speech tonight will be that Obama would be ready on day one. And with that, let's go downstairs. Uh, Chris Matthews with Senator John Tester of Montana, who flew into Denver today with Senator Obama. Chris? Okay, thank you, Keith. Well, tell me about that. What, would that, what was that like coming in with the candidate? Well, it was great. Yeah, uh, Barack was in uh, was in Montana this morning talking veterans issues. He spent a lot of time in Montana. Montana's an important state to him. He thinks he can win it. I think he can win it too. And uh, flew into Denver with him. It was uh, it was a great flight, something I'm not used to doing. Okay, we're just talking to Tom Brokaw because he grew up out there in South Dakota and he lives and spends some of his uh, year, every year out in Montana. Uh, well, you said you think. Well, Is Montana in play? Absolutely. Montanans are ready for change just like the, red, the whole country is. Yeah. You know, we've seen uh, our economy dip down, which is unusual. We're a natural resource state, but we've seen the economy dip down recently in the state of Montana. And, uh, and I think Barack brings the kind of vision for this country that we need. And uh, both domestically and from a foreign standpoint, I think Montanans will react to that positively. You know, we all grew up in the last 30, 40 years. It seems like the map never changes. There's that giant area of red in your part of the country. Well, so all the plain states, right through the mountain states, uh, all Republican, Republican automatically. Are you saying this could be the year that states like yours and perhaps uh, North Dakota will switch? Well, I think the Intermountain West is changing a lot. And, uh, and I think the fact that, uh, you know, we've had people like Max Baucus and, and uh, Harry Reid for years and years and years. Uh, but. A couple years ago, a governor you guys heard from last night, Governor Schweitzer, yeah. won. I won. In What's this with the crew cut out there? Well, man, it's, come on, we be styling. Everybody's got this. <laughs> is this is this come with the tractor or what? No, no, it's it's this, low maintenance. Oh, you got to wear the cat hat out there. It's you know? low maintenance. No, you're like, let me. Can I, can I do this? You, I charge for it. God, uh, it's great. <laughs> let me ask you again about uh, Montana. Mike Mansfield was one of my heroes growing up. Uh, a lot of these Irish guys went out there and worked in the silver mines. Yep. Tell me about the culture of that state and what makes it more interesting than some other states in that region. Well, I think, Irish. I, th I think you know we we were we were built in the late 1800s on copper and, and early 1900s. We've got a tremendous ag history in, in the state of Montana, a small business history, a working man history, and I think that all those all those groups Barack Obama appeals to. He really does, and I think that uh, I think that. Come November, you're going to see Montana in the blue column for Barack Obama. Last question back where I start. Last question. Give me the Howard Cosell on this guy. You were with him. 
Yeah. What was it? What kind of feel did he have today? Was he ready for the fight? Is he ready oh, for yeah. the big speech tomorrow night? Barack Obama in the flesh. What did it seem he, like? He was absolutely. He was relaxed. He was at ease. Uh, the crowd asked him questions. He ans answered them uh, non-scripted from his heart. Uh, flew in on the plane. He was very much at ease. I think he's going to blow the doors off this place tomorrow night. Tom Brokaw's got a question for you, Senator Tom. Take it away. Well, I was just going to ask whether you got a fresh buzz cap before coming down here. And this, the second question, a more serious political question. Senator Tesler, you were helped in your last race by the presence of a libertarian candidate on the ballot. Ron Paul going to be on the ballot in Montana, and will that help Senator Obama this fall drain Republican votes? Well, first of all, Tom, I did get a fresh cut yesterday morning, so uh, thank you for <laughs> noticing. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I do think that uh, choices are important, and I think that uh, both Bob Barr and, and Ron Paul can help uh, Senator Obama. But ultimately, it's his vision, it's Senator Obama's vision for this country that's going to win this race in Montana and this country uh, for making uh, uh, Barack Obama the next president of the United States. Okay, let's take it. Thank you very much, Senator thank John you, Tester Appreciate from Montana, it. the big sky country, home of Chet Huntley. Let's go back to, uh, to Keith Oberman. Keith, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Senator. All right, uh, coming up, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 7 o'clock out here, Bill Clinton and that speech that is uh, so imperative uh, to the Obama chances. And then uh, a little after 10 o'clock Eastern Time, we will hear the nomination of Vice President uh, the nominee. Senator Biden, who will then speak uh, for perhaps as much as 20 minutes. That's part of the night schedule ahead here on uh, day three of the Democratic Convention. Coming up immediately for us, we'll hear from Nora O'Donnell and our panel. And in our next hour, our President Jimmy Carter will be our guest. You're watching MSNBC's live coverage of the Democratic National Convention. MSNBC's coverage of the 2008 Democratic National Convention. Former President Bill Clinton set to speak 90 minutes from now to essentially say Senator Obama will be ready on day one. That's the early word we're hearing from the Clinton aides quoted. Right now, let's introduce our panel led by MSNBC's chief Washington correspondent, Nora O'Donnell, and featuring Eugene Robinson of The Washington Post. MSNBC political analyst Michelle Bernard and MSNBC political analyst Pat Buchanan. Nora? Keith, thank you very much. And I think we're all still soaking in really the historic nature of today because when this convention's over, when this campaign is over, and we're all old, our kids and everyone is going to remember August 27, 2008 is the day a party nominated a black man to be nominee of their party. Eugene? I'm not sure it's sunk in yet, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we knew it was coming. There was, uh, despite the attempt to create drama on the floor, there wasn't a lot of drama. Yet that moment when Hillary Clinton said those words by acclamation, you sensed that something had happened. Something had happened that had never happened in this country before, that, uh, uh, that marks a milestone in this country's nearly 400-year-old attempt to deal with race. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in 1619, the first slaves were brought to the United States, uh, landing at Jamestown. And since then, we've had this um, a troubled uh, history with race, yet one that has, yet we've made progress, we've moved. And, uh, and this is a, a, a giant step, no matter what happens in November. Sure. Um, uh, obviously, uh, the, the delegates gathered here in Denver hope that one specific thing happens in November, but no matter what happens in November, we have made history in 2008. That's right, and Michelle, you know, uh, we all love politics in many ways because it is about uh, history. And today, watching people cry on the floor of this convention and, and even Republicans feeling pride in their country today about what has happened. Reflect on that. Well, yeah, I mean, you absolutely cannot watch what happened today without a sense of pride. I was thinking earlier today about the Kerner Commission report that came out. We celebrated the 40th anniversary uh, of that report just a few months ago. And, you know, and after the riots um, that took place after the assassination of Martin Luther King and many others, um, there was this sense that black America was failing miserably and that, and that we would never get to a point in our nation's history where we 
where we would ever see a black man or black woman compete with whites on their own terms. And that's what we saw happen in this campaign. That's what we've seen happen in the Democratic primary process. And I could understand the tears that I saw. I know I have friends who have parents that are, that are in their 80s that have lived through Jim Crow and never thought that in, their, in a lifetime where you saw segregation and whites only, you know, waters, water fountains or where it was sure. illegal for a black man and a white woman to marry one another, that we would see a black man nominated as a, as a president, Democratic presidential nominee of the United States. I am struck too, Jean. I, I have to, um, that as tomorrow, Barack Obama gives this speech on the 45th anniversary of MLK's I Have a Dream speech. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking too, in, in Teddy Kennedy's 1980 speech, you know, the dream will never die. And on Monday too, the dream lives on. Uh, that language, too, sort of evoking this moment where we are living the dream in exactly. some ways. Exactly. We, we, we talk about the dream. Uh, it's insubstantial. It's distant. Yet it's here. And it's hard to realize that it's actually here. But, it, but uh, uh, it, it, it's made, um, made real in a, in a way. And I think tomorrow night will just be an incredible moment. I was speaking with um, John Lewis earlier today, and as he as he just said on the floor, he 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 told me he was sure he would cry tomorrow. Actually, <laughs> that he did have more tears, oh, yeah. and he was sure they would flow. Uh, and when you, when you think of someone like him and the life he has led uh, and what he has seen. And even in my own lifetime, uh, I remember whites only lunch counters. I remember whites only playgrounds and water fountains um, uh, growing up in South Carolina. Uh, and to see an African American as, uh, and, and not, not just Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, the Obama kids, uh, the, this cadre of uh, Ivy League, eminently prepared, what does totally that do to professional the African American. I mean, other than us sitting up here and sort of talking about it, what does that do to the country? Young children to sort of look and see Barack Obama well, out there. Look, it, it's interesting because really young children don't look at race the way that, that we do. They don't see it at all. They don't see people in terms of color. They don't, I don't think that the sense of race discrimination that's, that, that people of a certain age feel and remember uh, exists with this generation of children today. I mean, in a sense, uh, younger people, I, I truly believe younger men and women um, now are getting to a point in life where they are realizing Martin Luther King's words when he said that he wanted his children to be judged on the basis of their character, on the content yeah. of their character, not on the color of their skin. And I think that this proves that, 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 that we are moving a long way uh, to get there. Pat, talk about, too, what happened on the floor today with Hillary Clinton, right. uh, as Jean mentioned, essentially, uh, trying to show a great deal of unity in this right. party. And many people even from the floor saying, finally, they feel a sense of that this party is united. Well, first, let me say, uh, I go back even longer than Gene. I remember whites only signs in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I was in the Lincoln Memorial the day Dr. King gave his address at wow. the Lincoln Memorial. I'd come back as a young journalist and took my brother. I said, I think this is going to be historic here. And listen to that speech. They started at the Washington Monument. It was very moving. And this is a historic day for America. And it is the end of one of the most exciting campaigns I have ever seen or witnessed or read about. We were out there in Iowa when yeah. Hillary, Hillary got beat and she came roaring back in New Hampshire and people were yelling. And then you're on to Nevada and South Carolina where Barack Obama beats her two to one. And then you went on, she was down on, to come back on Super Tuesday, Pennsylvania, Ohio. West Virginia, she beats him by 41 points. It was so authentic, such a great campaign. Let me put a note of dissent. I was disappointed in the way they conducted the roll call. Why not an authentic roll call which shows Barack Obama winning by about 100 votes, going through one state after another, people cheering for their candidate, and at the end of that, have Hillary Clinton come up and congratulate Barack Obama. Why all these whips and party types going to people and saying in California, apparently, no, no, you're not going to be allowed to vote because maybe she will win the delegation. What happened to honesty? I remember in 76 when Reagan, he came as close to Gerald Ford, and I was up there with Reagan, you know, standing there, and when he lost that count, I walked out in the hall, and I was choked up, and I saw, you know, hard right-wing conservatives were crying their eyes out. It was honest. I wish this honesty and authentic, and it's in my party now as well yeah. as this party. Exactly, Everybody's yeah. saying it. Let's make put on a show of unity. 
Look, if there's an honest division in the party, why not show that because people are honestly divided? Because everybody remembers what happens in 1976, Pat. But I mean, so Hillary I got beat. Point. We all know she got beat. She ran a great campaign. But why not show, let her people get up and vote? They were voted as delegates to come here. And let me tell you a story. In Michigan in 96, one of my gals came to me and she said, Pat, she's in Michigan, they tell me that if I vote for you in this convention, I will never work in the Republican Party again. So I said, look, don't destroy your, your future in the party, anything like that. And she broke out crying. And she went and voted for me, and they threw her out of the party. You know, never in the party again. <laughs> These are people are coming out. Hillary's people, Barack Kucinich has probably got 10 people. They wanted to vote for him for various reasons. Maybe yeah. it's Abu Ghraib or something. Yeah. Why not honesty? Because, because we stage manage things these days. And in both parties, it's the Republican Party, Democrat Party, Democrat Party. Why do we do it? Because there's a 24-hour cable news cycle. We're responsible. You may be they right. They're trying that to thwart us. Right. That, <laughs> they're trying to thwart us. But, you know, even with all of the stagecraft, though, and I, and, and I don't want to take away from the monumental nature of what happened sure. today, but I think that that the disunity in the Democratic Party is glaring. I mean, the last day, this afternoon, was about appeasing Hillary Clinton. You know, the supporters there who were waiting for her, it was very dramatic, Hillary marching into the, uh, into the, um, into the Pepsi Center today, and the people shouting, Hillary, Hillary, Hillary. It was about Hillary Clinton. It was not about Barack Obama. It was the same thing that I find in terms of uh, faulty stagecraft the night that Hillary Clinton finally decided to suspend her campaign. It should have been about Barack Obama, and it wasn't. It was about Clinton's, and I think that disunity is its glaring, and the entire world is watching it. Well, All right. I kind of disagree, because I think that, in, you know, you had to go through this. She got nearly half the votes in the primary, so she deserved her moment. But she didn't get them today. She didn't get them today, and she didn't get them today. And, yeah. didn't didn't get them today. and we all know people aren't going to look at that roll yeah. call count no. from today. No. All right, team. Well, we're going to have much more with the panel, Keith. And I'm, I, I kept thinking here, as, as everyone was talking, what Tim would say on a day like today, he would say, what a country, which was one of his, uh, of yeah. course, favorite <laughs> phrases. Keith. Yep. I'm glad you mentioned him as well, Nora, and he would have added, isn't this great? Okay, let's go right down to the convention floor again with Andrew Mitchell. Hey, Chris. Um, I've moved from New York to New Jersey to another Hillary Clinton supporter, Governor John Corzine. You were not surprised that Hillary Clinton sucked it in and came out here and did what she did. I have nothing but the greatest admiration for her. One of the reasons I supported her throughout the primary season is I think she's a woman of character. Uh, she does the right thing. She knows that making sure that we get united and solidly united Barack Obama change the terms and conditions of the lives of people in the country. And so she did what she had to do. Bill Clinton has been quoted as saying that he doesn't think Barack Obama can win. Uh, you know, I, I think you and I had that conversation before. I've had both private conversations and public uh, appearances with him where I have heard him say the opposite of that. This is going to be a tough fight. He'll talk about it in the context of People don't play by Marcus of Queensbury rules on the other side, and it's going to be a, a dogfight. We're going to win, and I know Bill Clinton believes that. And what we have to do is make sure we take the enthusiasm and the unity we have here and take it out on the road so we unify the country about changing economic policy and foreign policy and energy policy and all the things that will make a difference in people's lives. Thank you very much, John Corzine. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Chris. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Let's go right now to Joe Scarborough. He's the host of the immensely popular Morning Joe. He's inside the Pepsi Center. Joe, your thoughts for tonight? Well, you know, uh, only one word you can, can, can attach to this, and it's history. A lot of people are obviously focusing on the fact that we have the first African-American uh, major party candidate to get the nomination. I think two remarkable things happened tonight. Hillary Clinton turned that over to Barack Obama, and we saw an evolution of Hillary Clinton, a woman who in New Hampshire saved her candidacy in part uh, by appealing to women. And that victory was a victory based primarily on gender. But as she moved forward, as she fought on, as she persevered through Ohio and Texas and West Virginia, it stopped being a candidacy about 
a woman and started being a candidacy about a political force. Hillary Clinton found her voice halfway through this campaign and by the end of spring was a force in her own right and was being judged as a political figure first and as a woman second. I'm struck sitting here talking to Tom Brokaw beforehand, thinking about when I lived in Atlanta, Georgia as a very young kid, he was reporting for WSB on the civil rights movement. A few years later, I moved to Meridian, Mississippi. We lived out in the country, and my parents sent us to a school that in 1969, and it was the first year that school had been integrated. And so I started first grade in a class that was 50% black, 50% white, and I thank God for that blessing in a school that was about 45 miles from Philadelphia, Mississippi, because I spent my entire life, I think about as colorblind, uh, uh, my generation at least, uh, as any generation. So when I see Barack Obama winning this nomination tonight, I'm not moved so much by tears. I think it's great for this country, but my attitude is, what took so long? What's the big deal? Barack Obama is a political force in his own right. He created a grassroots campaign that no white or black politician has ever created. He raised more money more quickly, used it more effectively, uh, invested in a grassroots organization uh, with an efficiency that no other political candidate's done. And I think that's the real victory for this country tonight. America is a stronger country tonight because a woman who was judged as a political force first and as a woman second passed the nomination over to an African-American who, I've got to tell you, people who are 45, 46, 47 and younger don't look at primarily as an African-American, but as a political force who may really be the next president of the United States. It's just like the British in their time of need in 1979. They picked Margaret Thatcher, not because she was a woman, but because they thought she was the toughest leader for Great Britain at that time, and they believed she could turn that country around. She did, and perhaps in America, Barack Obama can, and when he does that, nobody will look back and say, isn't it great that an African American did that? They'll say, isn't it great that America found a leader who could do that? That is truly, Chris, truly a historic achievement and it's a wonderful night tonight because of that. No affirmative action here in this hall or in the snows of Iowa or New Hampshire or South Carolina or any of the states that followed. This was a campaign won based on merit and the strongest man won. Okay, Joe Scarborough starts tonight. We'll see you tomorrow morning on Morning Joe. Up next, Luke Russert with reaction to Obama's nomination from younger, younger delegates out in the floor. Luke's going out in the floor to talk to them. This is MSNBC's coverage of the Democratic National Convention in Denver. MSNBC's coverage of the Democratic Convention. History made tonight, of course, as Barack Obama has become the first African American ever nominated by a major political party in just about any major country. Luke Russert is inside the Pepsi Center. He's been talking to the younger delegates about Obama's nomination. Yes, and that can. mix here, Luke, of, uh, of the, the new age and the new delegates, it must be pretty impressive. Keith, we often talk about the youth vote, but not quite this young. On here on the floor next to me is 17-year-old David Gilbert Pedersen, the youngest delegate here at the convention. David, how are you doing? Doing really well. How are you doing? Being a delegate is a lot of work. You're only 17. What inspired you to do it? Um, you know, I've been interning with the campaign, uh, Obama's campaign, since September of 07, volunteer since January of 07. I've just felt like I wanted to be there at the beginning. Uh, this seems like a good middle marker, and I hope I'm there at the end as well when we uh, elect the first African-American president and a man who will really bring change to our nation. We're also here with Sarah Keem, 20 years old, from Colorado. Sarah, you go to the, Colorado at Boulder. You've been organizing a lot. Colorado is a swing state. Are you guys going to turn this for Barack Obama? This is the first time Colorado is going to go blue in a long time. I'm really excited about it. This is my first time to vote. 
uh, in a presidential election in America, and we're completely fired up and ready to go, especially in Boulder. Now, I want to get both of you guys on this. President Clinton is going to address the convention hall tonight. What advice would you give President Clinton for his speech tonight? You start first, Dave. You know, I don't think I'm in any place to give uh, the former president any advice on anything, but I think he's going to do a great job firing up the, uh, the delegates here, and uh, he's going to get us ready to go out after, uh, after this convention and win an election for uh, Senator Obama and also for the congressional candidates and the Senate candidates across the country. How about you, sir? What do you want to hear him talk about? What advice do you have for him? You know, I think the message any Democrat needs to spread right now is unity and that, uh, just like Dave said earlier, this is the middle mark. And, you know, we're in the home stretch right now. And if everyone isn't completely on board, completely ready to do the work necessary to get this done, we're not going to see the change that Senator Obama, prom Obama promises. And so, you know, spread the message of unity and that let's get this done. David, I got to ask you, do your friends think you're weird at all, 17 years old, <laughs> doing this much stuff in politics already? Part of it is uh, partially yes, partially no, and partially they think I'm weird for other reasons. But, um, you know, I've met a lot of great young people uh, like Sarah and other people up uh, throughout the, the country who are delegates involved in the campaign, interning with the campaign. So most, I guess most people would think I was a bit of an anomaly, but there are some, there are some youth that are really involved, and you're seeing that more and more in 2008. And it's been an uh, increasing trend over the years, and I hope this year we can push it over the top. Sarah, were you ever involved in politics before Senator Obama? Um, not really. And so, like I said earlier, this is my first election, and I got involved working for the campaign and volunteering about a year and a half ago. We started the Students for Obama group up at CU, and I really just wanted to become as involved as I could and help this guy get elected and into the White House, because I really believe in what he says. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. You hear it from the youngest delegate at the entire convention and one who is organizing the entire state of Colorado. It's an important swing state. Back up to you guys, Keith and Chris. Some think, yeah, some, some think he's, he's strange, some think he's not strange, and some think he's strange for other reasons. What a great answer. Luke Russert uh, on the floor of the Pepsi Center. Thank you. Now it's uh, also in the Pepsi Center. Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota has been kind enough to join us for a few minutes. Congressman, thank you for your time this evening. Hey, how you doing there? Good to be on. There's another young man. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, this evening, this uh, uh, aftermath of the, 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 the moment that this becomes real, that Barack Obama is the nominee of the Democratic Party, obviously he gets the title tomorrow, but it's in the books now. Give me, uh, yep. give, just give me a, a, a roundup of your feelings at this moment. You know, I really feel that our country has overcome some tremendous history and walked into a whole new uh, sunlight. You know, we see America truly living up to the, the promise, the dream, a more perfect union. It's one of those uh, transcendent moments for me. And uh, I found myself dancing in my seat, and I'm all excited. There's, uh, is there much to be done uh, in terms of still even with this event today and with Senator Clinton's speech last night, is there still much to be done by President Clinton in, uh, in his address in a little over an hour, or uh, have things been cleared up already? Well, I think that uh, President Clinton's um, uh, opinion on things and his views are going to weigh heavily on people's mind. I mean, the fact is, we all know about this uh, drive for unity. Hillary Clinton set the uh, foundation for it. But I'm afraid that we're, the country's looking for President Clinton to really sort of put the icing on the cake. I think a lot of people all, all realize that he maybe took her, um, uh, her defeat harder than she did. Uh, it was tough for him to watch. And just watching his facial expressions during her speech uh, the other day, uh, you could tell that he's really, really emotionally connected to this thing. Congressman, let me read you some words you may recognize being from Minnesota. To those who say, my friends, to those who say that we are rushing this issue of civil rights, I say to them, we are 172 years late. To those who say, to those who say that this civil rights program is an infringement on civil rights, on states' rights, I say this, the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. Tell us the pedigree of those words, sir. The gentleman from Minnesota. 1948 Democratic Convention, 
Hubert H. Humphrey spoke those words and they ring in my ears every time I drive by the city council building in the city of Minneapolis. His statue is there. Uh, Hubert Horatio Humphrey is alive in Minneapolis. And, uh, you know, his words, I believe, were brought to a full extent tonight. And they're going to be, but there's more to do. But, you know, I'm so proud of my country. I'm so proud to be a Minnesotan when you uh, uh, cite the words of, of Hubert H. Humphrey. It's really, really an amazing day. Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota on the, uh, uh, at sunset almost of the amazing day. Uh, thank you kindly for your time, sir. Great to be here. Thanks a lot. When Chris Matthews and I return from Denver, former President Jimmy Carter will join us. And coming up in one hour, a speech from former President Bill Clinton and more after this. MSNBC's coverage of the Democratic Convention, where history was made here tonight in Denver. Senator Barack Obama, now the first American, African-American candidate to earn a major party nomination for president. Senator Hillary Clinton stopped the roll call vote, so Obama could be nominated by acclamation. Let's declare together in one voice, right here, right now, that Barack Obama is our candidate and he will be our president. Madam Secretary, I move that the convention suspend the procedural rules and suspend the further conduct of the roll call vote. All votes cast by the delegates will be counted and that I move Senator Barack Obama of Illinois be selected by this convention by acclamation as the nominee of the Democratic Party for President of the United States. An hour from now, of course, we're going to see if the Democratic unity continues when former President Bill Clinton takes to the stand, to the stage, I should say. There's a slip. I'm Chris Matthews alongside Keith Elberman. We have a special guest. Have you, did you notice? I noticed the button he's got on, too, the former president. President Jimmy Carter joins us. Welcome. Good to be with you all. Thank you. We've been, every time we think we have gotten a measure of how meaningful what we saw today at the Pepsi Center was, what a landmark this is in American history, it seems like it echoes back across the land and hits us freshly once again. Tell me your thoughts today now that there is an African American nominated by a major party for president of the United States. I doubt that there's a white person in America that has more deep and personal relationships with that question. And I think I'm the world's foremost expert on divided parties. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a community, I didn't have any white neighbors. Uh, all of my playmates were African American, black children. All the people with whom I worked in the field were black. I was uh, raised in a black culture. I lived there until I was 16 years old and went off to the Navy and to, the, and to college. I saw the devastating blight of millstone around our necks with racial segregation, which was legal then. I went into the Navy and uh, the first sign I saw of an easing of this, uh, of this tragedy was when Harry Truman unilaterally as commander in chief ordained that racial discrimination was over in the military forces. And when I was a midshipman, uh, the first black midshipman was entered into the Naval Academy. I helped defend him against some of the attacks. And so to me, this is uh, a momentous event for America and I think has a prospect of being a momentous event for the entire world. My wife and I have been in about 125 countries since I left the White House and we see the excitement all over the globe with the uh, rise of uh, Barack Obama as a potential Democratic nominee and obviously as a potential uh, president. So it means a lot to me. When he made his speech in Philadelphia, I, I wept because he expressed the uh, the essence of racial discrimination clearly. And I've lived in a state that has been blighted with uh, racial discrimination ever since, I would say, 1964, when Lyndon Johnson was a hero for civil rights and didn't even come into Georgia because he knew it was hopeless. And since then, the Deep South has been uh, dominated by the Republican Party, using the race issue as a subtle and sometimes overt 
uh, mechanism to gain, gain a majority. Our last governor's election, for instance, was uh, decided you know, on a Confederate flag yeah. issue. And I remember that when uh, my opponent in 1980 uh, opened his campaign, Ronald Reagan, it was in the little town in Mississippi where the three civil rights workers were buried in a, in a dam. So I've seen it in the South, subtle sometimes, but I think that's over now. And I think the indirect answer would be what's happened in Georgia this year when Barack Obama prevailed, got a majority of the votes against uh, two very attractive white candidates, John Edwards, a next door neighbor, and uh, Hillary Clinton. He, he carried Georgia, he carried Plains, Georgia, which only has 180 votes. So I think that that is extremely important uh, in, in, in my life and for this country. And I believe that um, we'll see that th he has put an end to the, um, to the problem in our country ever since the Civil War began in 1861. I think this is a light. There'll, there'll still be some people that won't vote for him because he happens to be African-American. But I think that, uh, that number is dwindling every year. Mr. President, let me ask you about next week's Republican convention. It may be a perfect storm, not just metaphorically, with Hurricane Gustav heading up through the Gulf. Uh, you have, I was in a small part in your administration, as you know, a very small part, when you created FEMA. You've said in the recent hours, I believe, that FEMA is not up to the job. Are we going to have another Katrina next week in the midst of the Republican convention in St. Paul? Well, I hope not for the benefit of the Republicans, but primarily for the benefit of people that might be struck. Uh, as you may remember, you were there with me as in the administration uh, when I uh, organized and, and established FEMA by executive order. I didn't want to have to go through the Congress. I thought it was very important. So we brought in 33 agencies into FEMA with three basic characteristics. One, it was completely independent and reported only to the president. Secondly, it was fully funded. And third, it was uh, headed by a professional in the dealing with uh, national catastrophes. Well, all three of those things were abolished before Katrina struck. Uh, it was buried deep within Homeland Security, remotely from the White House. It was not adequately funded, and it was headed by Brownie, who d was congratulated on doing a wonderful job by President Bush. So all of those things were wiped out. I believe now, though, that since the catast catastrophe in, in the Katrina area, uh, that FEMA has reconstituted itself, at least with professional uh, guidance. So I believe that next time, if a disaster hits, that FEMA will be much better qualified. President Carter, it's, it's about 50 minutes from now that uh, a, a fellow former president, it's not a big club, uh, goes in front of a political convention in which his, his wife was the runner-up and is now parring, uh, going there to do the last bit of knitting together of the unity idea here. Yeah, I know, I, I know you have. I'm just wondering if, if, if you had, what, what, to what degree is a, is a former president constrained politically, even within his own party, under these circumstances? What, what should President Clinton not do, or what should he do uh, to, to, to uh, achieve this unity and maintain the, uh, the w whatever status there is of a former president? Well, there are three things I think that, that President Clinton should do. One is point out his administration, how good it was, and how much it will be changed adversely if John McCain's elected. Those are the two things. The other one is to express his full confidence in Barack Obama as an ex-president. Uh, I think that is something that would be the most important, is to let that be no doubt that to follow up on what uh, Hillary has done so well, in my opinion, that Bill Clinton will also say, I stand by my wife and having full support and full confidence in Barack Obama and Joe Biden is the next team to head our nation. There is uh, some early reporting on those who have seen uh, President Clinton's speech that he may in fact turn around what we heard in the primary season and make some sort of statement that at least means, if not th these, these, these exact words, that he will be ready to go on day one. I've always wondered uh, if, if any president... And Obama will be yes, ready Yes, indeed. I understand. If, if any, <clears throat> if, if, uh, the, the question of experience, uh, when you hear uh, uh, somebody running for president has has experience or no experience you've never been president before i imagine there's no experience like it in the world that prepares you for it is there no i think if i'm not mistaken that john kennedy is the last president elected in 1960 that came directly out of the out of the congress mm -hmm. and of course lyndon johnson was a former congressman and others but he was vice president first 
So Obama has much more experience in foreign affairs from a national level than I did, or the, obviously George Bush did, or Clinton did when he was elected. And I think that fact he's been in Washington, he served on the, on the Armed Services Committee, working side by side with Joe Biden, gives him a great insight into global affairs from the perspective of the federal government, much more than most presidents have had uh, in the recent 50 years. So I think that's a very weak argument against uh, Obama. If there were some that doubted that, since he's only been there a short time, to have Joe Biden at his side now, mm -hmm. having spent 35 years there in the Senate as head of the Foreign Relations Committee, a lot of that time, I think is a very good assuagement of any concern that might be existing. One more question. Uh, when you look at this, uh, you've been through a few presidential elections. <laughs> Do you think this looks good for the Democrats? I mean, give me a tough reading on November right now. Is the race factor going to stop him from making it? Is he going to overcome it? When you look at old cities in the north, not just in the south, is it doable right now? Well, this is my 10th convention. Hmm. My first one was as a novice governor. I made the nominating speech for Scoop Jackson in Miami in 72. And then I went through obviously 76 and 80. And I've seen parties divided. I've, I was elected perhaps because the Republicans were divided in 1976 when Ronald Reagan challenged Gerald Ford, the incumbent president, and never did yield. And they went through the convention with a horrible split. And it was months after that before the Reagan supporters reluctantly came back and voted for Ford. I still got a majority of the votes. But I think that uh, I also lost to some degree in 1980 because the Democratic Party was split. I think that by the end of the convention tomorrow night, we will have a completely united party. And I think that will overcome any sort of detriment that might accrue from the fact that uh, a, a vestige of racism still exists in America. And a, and, a, and a vestige of racism exists in almost every country in the world. But I think we've proven already that the termination of racial discrimination or racism is basically over in this country. And I think we'll prove that in November. Do you see a difference between uh racial discrimination as it continues uh, in the North, as opposed to racial attitudes in the South. You've been all over the country. Is there a difference in the way people are progressing, different speeds, different, different advances, different uh, resistances? Well, I think there's a little of that racial discrimination or pride in one's old race may be a more benevolent way to express it all over the country. I just said all over the world, in effect. But the Republican Party's strength based on the race issue has obviously been most dominant in the South. And uh, I carried every state in the South, except Virginia. And, uh, but others have had a very difficult time carrying. In fact, I'm the last person, who, Democrat, who carried North Carolina. And, and I, think, I think that this time we're gonna see a change in that, Chris. I, believe, I really believe that the, that the recent votes we've seen in the primary between Obama and very attractive white candidates in the Southern states is a good omen, a prediction of what's going to happen in November. I think that race is just going to fade into the remote past. Thank you very much, Mr. President. What a, what a great outcome that would be. Thank you, President Carter. Happy a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Stick with it, man. Good Thank night, you, sir. All right, uh, former President Bill Clinton will speak about 47 minutes from now. Let's turn to Newsweek's Richard Wolf at the campaign listening post. New information on President Clinton's speech. Richard? I still wear the baseball Yes, indeed, cap. Keith. I can tell you that for all the talk about uh, President Clinton's speech being heavily vetted and edited by the Obama campaign, the Obama campaign, according to a senior Obama advisor, only just saw the speech maybe an hour ago. Uh, this speech was late in coming in, uh, not uncharacteristic for President Clinton. Uh, senior Clinton aides tell me they were frozen out of the process. Even his longtime speechwriter was out of it. This was a speech that was personally crafted by President Clinton uh, and is likely to run much longer than the 10 minutes he's currently expected to. Okay. What we're also hearing is that President Clinton is going to mention Barack Obama's name uh, after about 10 words into this speech. So for all of those of us with our antenna up, looking for the shout out, looking for the commentary on Barack Obama's qualifications to be president and commander in chief, that reference is going to come very early. And the other aspect of this speech, I'm told again from Clinton folks who've only just seen this speech in the last hour or so, President Clinton is going to be talking extensively about restoring America's position in the world, the damage done to America's reputation through the course of the Bush administration. So that's the early insight that I'm getting from my sources here inside the Pepsi Center.
So bottom line, you, Richard, Chris. we're going to walk out here. We're going to walk out of this convention hall watching tonight with a sense that Bill Clinton has really endorsed Barack Obama as the next. Let me ask this specifically. The next commander in chief. That's exactly what the Obama campaign is expecting, that he will directly address his own experience as commander in chief. The, the tests, the demands on a commander in chief, he can speak with authority about that. And the question then becomes, what does he say about Obama's credentials? Again, I'm told early on, he'll be saying that Barack Obama is the right man to be the next commander in chief. Okay, thank you very much, Richard Wolf, down on the floor. Coming up, our insiders will be with us, former U.S. Congressman Harold Ford and Republican strategist Mike Murphy. You're watching MSNBC's live coverage of the Democratic National Convention. coming up live on the floor of the convention in 42 minutes now. And what a speech that should be based on what we're hearing, the reporting on it from Richard Wolf and others about uh, how he is going to address, basically try to roll back that idea that uh, Senator Obama would not be ready on day one. Uh, this is the most sensitive, mm -hmm. and I think everyone has reported this, no one knows what's in anyone's heart, but the grand reporting of this convention is that Hillary Clinton has been the professional. She has stepped up to the plate. It has taken her a couple of months, but she recognizes her role in history now. Bill Clinton, we don't know, we don't know obviously from the evidence, but the reporting is that it's still a sensitive point with him, that he has to play this particular role, endorsing a candidate who defeated his spouse. It's not an easy role for anyone. And it will be a dramatic event if it comes through as we're expecting it to be. Tammy Duckworth, the Iraq War veteran, director of the Illinois Veterans Affairs Department, joins us now uh, from the Pepsi Center. A pleasure to talk with you. Good to be here, Keith. All right, do you think this is all now knitted back together again, that whatever there was out there between Senator Clinton's speech last night and the acclamation vote this afternoon and in anticipation of President Clinton's speech tonight, do you think this is all, all back in one piece? You know, I was on the floor last night and we were all shouting and screaming for Senator Clinton and by the end of the night, we as a delegation were just thrilled. Um, you know, she's, she's from Illinois as well and we're thrilled that she did what we needed for her to do, which is to unite the party. And I'm sure by the time this convention ends tomorrow, we're going to be a fully united party. Give me your assessment of where uh, Senator Obama stands and where the party stands right now on an issue that is so critical to so many and so personal for so many, including yourself, ending the war in Iraq. Well, you know, Senator Obama has actually a strategy for ending the war in Iraq that is more than just a surge. He understands that anywhere you put American troops, they're going to be successful, especially if you put another 30,000 troops. But it takes more than just the troops on the ground. It takes a diplomatic effort. It takes also the Iraqi government stepping up and doing their part. And so I think this is why I support Senator Obama, because he's got that complete plan for what we need to do to get out of Iraq. You know, John McCain, on the other hand, thinks that we can just keep the surge going for another 50 to 100 years. That's simply something that we cannot do as a nation. Tammy, how important is the Iraq issue this November? You know, Chris, I think the Iraq issue is very important. I think that the people are watching it. You know, one of the things I want to bring up is the fact that four years ago, I was watching this convention from Iraq. And I was then hoping and praying that the country would make the right decision. And eight days after November 4th of 2004, I was blown up. We should remember that the troops are watching right now everything that we do and we say. And they need to know that Barack Obama is supporting them. And in fact, he actually has six times the number of contributions from deployed service members than John McCain. So the mm. troops are behind him. He support his plan. And actually, he's got a five-time um, uh, over John McCain in terms of a total veterans. So the issue is very important, especially for those in the military. Can I ask you about that? Because we don't hear much about that. When you're in the ranks, under fire, in a dangerous situation, is there much political scuttlebutt? And is it open-ended? Are you allowed to take an anti-war position or a critical position in the ranks when you're, ch when you're having scuttlebutt? You know, when you're, when you're fighting 
and the bullets are flying. All you're worried about is completing the mission and taking care of you and your buddies. And that's all our troops are worried about, and that's all they should have to worry about. One of the things that Americans don't realize is that the troops have opinions, but when they get the privilege of wearing the uniform of this great country, they give up their freedom of speech. They can't speak out. That doesn't mean they don't have opinions. And I'll tell you, over the last three, four years, I've had more and more of my buddies come up to me and say, you know what, Tammy? You were right all along. We were not supposed to go into, into Iraq. That was the wrong thing to do. We should be crushing Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And that is what uh, Barack Obama is, hey, that's part of his plan, is that we need to get back to the fight in Afghanistan and destroy the enemies who attacked us on 9-11. And the troops believe that. Tammy, one last question, and it pertains to a lot of answers that have come from Senator McCain to a lot of different questions, uh, in which his judgment has been questioned, in which some of his conduct has been has been questioned, and how many homes he has has been questioned, and answers have come back that have pertained to his period of time as a prisoner of war. Given your service and your sacrifice to this country, what what is the political entitlement, if you will? What political benefit of the doubt should be given to to a former? A disabled service person or, a, or a, 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 an imprisoned ex-POW service person, how far does it go and at what point is it no longer relevant? Well, I think the point is when you look at exactly how both he and Senator Obama have conducted themselves in the Senate. Frankly, I think a good example is the GI Bill, the new GI Bill for the 21st century, which is the first biggest, most major increase in veterans benefits since the Vietnam era. And when the time came to cast a vote, Barack Obama was there, he co-sponsored it, he voted for it. John McCain, when it came time for him to support the troops and support the veterans, ducked the vote, said it was too expensive and went to a fundraiser instead. I think the proof is in the voting record. The proof is in how they've conducted themselves. Barack Obama wants to end means testing for the VA. He wants assured funding for the VA. And John McCain, on the other hand, wants to privatize it. So it comes right down to, you know, are you walking the walk or are you just talking the talk? Tammy Duckworth, uh, the director of the Illinois Veterans Affairs, uh, who will address the convention this evening. Great thanks for your service and great thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Chris. Ann Curry is on the podium now uh, at the Pepsi Center with the Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid. Ann. Thank you so much, Keith. Listen, I've got to ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid, you just watched Hillary Clinton launch this convention into an historic moment, uh, nominating the first African-American person as President of the United States. What went through you watching that moment? Well, for me, it's a dream come true to think that this man, this young man who has really lived the American dream, who is one of us. He doesn't have seven homes. He had to borrow money to go to school. He made it on the fact that he had a, a loving mother and some grandparents that sacrificed a great deal for him. Uh, I just, I, and keep in mind, he's gonna not only change our country, he's gonna change the world for the better. What struck you about that moment? And, and, and has Hillary done enough? to prevent a political insurgency in, the, in your party. I came up, came into the building a little while ago. Hillary and I were there. We hugged, talked a little bit, told each other how much we loved one another. Hillary Clinton came up in the ninth inning. The base is loaded. She's the only batter, and she knocked one out of the park. She did what we knew she would do. She's a wonderful woman, and I can't express enough how proud I am of her and how America is proud of this woman. But has she done enough to convince her supporters to go Obama? She's told them she's voting for Barack Obama here and on November 4th. So you're convinced, they're convinced, that they're going to vote. They're not going to stay home. Yeah. You bet. We got a poll out of Nevada today for the first time. We're ahead by five points, a CNN poll. We're, we're, that's a battleground state, and we're going to win it. You have worked very closely with the Clintons. What does Bill Clinton have to do tonight? What does he have to say here tonight to satisfy the party? None of us have to worry about Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's going to come out here and does what he always does, mesmerize the audience. We're going to be talking about his speech for a long time to come. What Bill, do you think he's going to say? Do you know what he's going to say? Oh, I have no idea, but I guarantee you he's going to say, we cannot elect John McCain. He's wrong. He doesn't have the temperament to be president. He's wrong on the war. He's wrong in the economy. He's not good for this country. Obviously, you're fired up. 
Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, thank you so much for speaking to us and congratulations on your speech tonight. All right, Keith, Chris, back to you. Dan Curry uh, doesn't have the temperament, not the first time uh, that we've heard that from a Democratic leader. It's one of the new uh, themes being rolled out by the Democratic Party about McCain. Doesn't have the temperament, uh, Patrick Leahy said it the other day, too. Uh, we're going to have our, uh, our first visit with our insiders next. Later on, we'll be joined by uh, former President Clinton's press secretary, D.D. Myers, as we get closer to his big speech at the top of the hour. And uh, as we go to break here, you'll be seeing videotape of the Melissa Etheridge performance at uh, the convention center. Our coverage. What's going on here? Time for politics. That is our mission, Democrats. Let's elect Barack Obama and Joe Biden for that future worthy of our great country. This is the time for MSNBC's unconventional convention coverage. If you supported Hillary Clinton and heard this speech and you go out and vote for John McCain, you just offended Hillary Clinton. All day convention coverage continues on MSNBC. the Democratic National Convention. We're joined by the insiders, longtime and much respected Republican strategist Mike Murphy and former U.S. Congressman from Tennessee, Harold Ford Jr. Gentlemen, I want to ask you a very pointed question. Politically speaking, politically speaking, is this convention achieving the goal of uniting the Clinton forces with the Obama forces with the purpose of winning an election? Mike Murphy. No, I give it a B, not an A. It's a solid convention, but so far, not a remarkable one. It had high points, it's had a little flatness. I was surprised, I felt a little better about it, but I wandered around some of the hotels today, met a couple of delegates, met some very seasoned politicians from the swing states who I've known a long time, who pulled me inside and said, you know, this thing doesn't feel as good as it should. Now, I'll put a big parenthetical on that. It's only, it's only been the wind-up. Now it's going to be Barack Obama's show tomorrow, and I think Bill Clinton can do some good tonight. I'm going to be watching to see if they can change the channel after Clinton's speech and make this convention really about Barack Obama, because he's what this election boils down to for the Democrats. they got to sell him. He'll have his shot tomorrow. We'll see how he does. Harold Ford, your assessment. Give it a grade. I give it a B plus. I think it can rise to, and I agree with Mike to a large extent, uh, that tonight Senator Biden's comments will be very, very important. But this convention always belongs, any convention belongs to the nominee. And Barack will have to perform on Thursday night. I think expectations have probably been raised pretty doggone high. Uh, but he has proven when the, when the pitch has to be hit and the ball has to be connected with hard, he's done it. Um, I do think Bill Clinton tonight is going to do what Bill Clinton does so well. He's going to lay out in concrete, specific, and hard-hitting ways why John McCain is not fit to be president. We can speculate day in and day out about whether Hillary and Bill Clinton have aligned themselves with Barack Obama. Remember, elections, campaigns are about winning. And Hillary Clinton last night, I think, exceeded expectations. Bill Clinton tonight, as he did eight years ago, where he defined compassionate conservatism for Democrats as being nothing more than great, flowery, soft, lovely language. But when it came to action, there wouldn't be much. He will do a similar thing this evening, and I, I anticipate he will do it well. Mike, uh, the winner of an NBA game or any contest goes to the uh, team that really wants it, oftentimes. The team you can see really wants the final game. Do uh, the Republicans this time want it as much as the Democrats? I want a real tough assessment here. 
Yeah, no, I think both wanted a lot. The Republicans had been pretty demoralized during the primary, <clears throat> excuse me, watching the Obama phenomena. But now I think the feeling is it's flattened out. I think Obama has had a problem for all his great skills pivoting from a primary oriented message to a general election message. He's got time, but the Republicans are sensing a shot in a bad Republican year because they got a guy, McCain, who in the best scenario, and we'll see how his convention works out, open question, can run as a different kind of Republican. So Barack could underperform, McCain could overperform. That could give McCain an upset win. Barack has the advantage, McCain is in the hunt. Harold, it's hard for me to believe that. I talk to Republicans, they'll go along with McCain. He's not, it's not a love affair. Barack Obama has the love of at least a majority of the Democrats. What do you think? Chris, you said it better the other night than, you, than anyone has said it. Enthusiasm when you walk in a voting booth is irrelevant. A vote counts the same if you go in hyper excited or kind of excited. Anyone that believes that John McCain is not excited, won't be motivated, is not going to work hard, is kidding themselves. If there's anyone in the Obama campaign or anyone, which I don't believe there is, but if there's anyone that believes that this guy is not going to come out and give 110 percent. I traveled to Iraq with John McCain. We got out of a helicopter on a border in Israel. And he was had blood gushing down his face. It turned out he had hit his head on the top of a, a nail in the helicopter. He got stitched up in the back of a SUV and we continued the day. The guy was in his late 60s. I know a lot of guys in their 20s who would have said, we got to call the day. This guy is tough. Barack knows that, his campaign knows that. And I know that coming out of the Republican convention, Barack and Joe Biden, and there's no tougher candidate in the Senate than Joe Biden, I think they know what they're up against. Mike Murphy, as an Irish American, let me put the tough ethnic question. Back in 1928, the country wasn't ready to elect a Catholic, certainly not a New Yorker with a New York accent and manner. In 1960, they were ready to elect a rather aristocratic Irish Catholic uh, who didn't wear his religion on his sleeve. Are we in 60 or in 28 when it comes to race relations and race politics in this country? Well, I think the Irish will always lead the way to justice, but I do think <laughs> here's Barack's problem at the beginning, really, of this campaign. You got over 50% of the people say they want a Democrat. You got less than that, 45 or so, saying Barack. He's got a gap. He's got Democrats or Democrat-leaning voters who are not sold on him, and Hillary Clinton can't deliver them. They're not about Hillary Clinton. They're about not liking Barack. Only Barack can close the deal. If he runs a smart campaign, he might. But that is the question, and the racial aspect is there. It's unfortunate. We don't know how that's going to turn out. Here's the advantage he has, though, Chris, and this is where at one point I disagree with Mike fervently. Of that 12 to 15 percent of undecided voters, they have one common characteristic. They cannot stand the performance of this country over the last eight years. They believe George Bush has mismanaged the country. And if Barack and Joe Biden, which Biden did so well last Saturday, are able to tie McCain to Bush and make the case that Hillary Clinton made last night that we can't afford four more of the last eight years, they will win an overwhelming majority of that independent and undecided vote. And even a lot of that Hillary vote who will come to learn that John McCain uh, will appoint jurists to the bench who won't, who don't agree with him, who will pass an education plan that doesn't agree with them and might leave us in Iraq for but, several decades. But, but I would say some of those voters, those Catholic, blue-collar, white voters who are older, high school educated, are culturally conservative. Barack's got to be careful about alienating them. They're in Macomb County, Michigan, Cuyahoga County, Ohio. They're going to decide the election. He's got to be very careful with the liberalism. Anybody that has okay, a yeah. subprime loan, anyone that's <laughs> worried about their jobs and their health care are going to take a hard look at Barack Obama. And if he can make the case, he will win this race. Mike Murphy, you were quick to assign a grade to this convention, to assign a grade to this presidency. I'm sorry, Chris, couldn't hear. We had the. the I, I know you don't want to hear it. No, Assign a grade to this presidency, the Bush presidency. Give it a grade. You, Mike Murphy, with your name on it. A uh, C. Thank you very much. A C, a C for this administration. A C. A C for Mike Murphy. <laughs> a C. Hey, I tell the truth. An honest man. You're a great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike Murphy. Thank you, the insider, the other insider, Harold Ford. 25 minutes away right now from the scheduled start of the big speech of the night, certainly the first big one, Bill Clinton, the former president, about to weigh in, and he's a heavyweight. When we return, his former White House press secretary, our colleague, Dee Dee Myers. By the way, there's, there's Michelle Obama up there, and you're watching it, all the coverage, MSNBC's coverage of the Democratic National Convention live from Denver.
place inside the Pepsi Center. Her husband will be giving one of the most important speeches of the entire Democratic pre-campaign campaign as the uh, stitching is, last stitching is put back into place in the party. Uh, done so marvelously by her last night and again this afternoon in moving for the vote by acclamation of Barack Obama as the Democratic nominee for 2008. Later tonight, after Bill Clinton's speech, the speech from vice presidential nominee Joe Biden. And as we await President Clinton's speech, we're joined by former Clinton White House Press Secretary D.D. Myers. Well, I'm sure, D.D., many a night in the White House you went through the scurrying that went into that last yeah. minute uh, drafting process. What do you think it's like in the uh, suite of the Clintons right now? Well, you know, I, I just saw a motorcade pull up from the balcony, and I assume it was President Clinton arriving just a couple minutes ago here at the Pepsi Center. But I remember, I mean, Bill Clinton never finished a speech until he absolutely had to, and I, I know that's still his pattern, and so I'm sure he was making notes, scribbling notes onto his text as he drove here and asking some poor aide to enter them into the computer so they could show up on the prompter five minutes from now. Uh, it was always a, a, a hair-raising experience to see how uh, how he liked to do that, how he was comfortable with it, and somehow he almost always managed to pull it off. You know, remind, I'm sure it was like those scenes in the movie Broadcast News, you know, with uh, yeah. Joni Cusack racing along right. putting the tape in the machine. Let me right. ask you about it, last night, yes, like uh, uh, Let me ask you about uh, what it was like watching uh, the former president watch Mrs. Clinton or Senator Clinton last night. What was that like? Right. You know the, you know all the Clinton story. You know it all. <laughs> well, I, I lived a couple of chapters of it. I, I'm not sure I know it all, but I, you know, it was moving to watch him watch her. You could see the tears in his eyes, and you could sort of feel the emotion and kind of imagine what he was going through. This race was very tough on losing. It was very tough on Hillary Clinton, but I think in many ways Bill Clinton has taken it harder. I think it's hard to lose, but it's harder to watch somebody you love sometimes go through, uh, to lose a race that you believe that they should have won. Um, but I thought Hillary Clinton really did a terrific job last night. I think she just nailed it. And when she said, she delivered that line about, um, and I ask you, why did you get into this? Did you get into it for me or did you get it in, into it for them? And I don't think anybody could walk out of here, any of those delegates, not knowing what she clearly wanted them to do, which was to work to elect Barack Obama. Now, we'll see what President Clinton has to say tonight. The one thing I think we're all sure of is this will not be a 10-minute speech, even though he has a 10-minute slot. Uh, well, that's going out on a limb, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Are, are we I'm, sure? Hey, I'm Can nothing if not brave. <laughs> that's, okay. Are we now? Everything, every bit of reporting from Richard Wolf through uh, the Associated Press to Andrea Mitchell, everybody who's heard anything about what's in this speech has agreed there is going to be some attempt to roll back specifically the "he's not ready to be commander in chief" meme from the primary season. How? Right good do you have to be to roll back what was one of the two or three cornerstones of the primary campaign against this man? How good do you have to be? What, what magic do you have to summon? Well, look, I don't think he has to convince everybody uh, the first time he utters the words. I think the most important thing he has to do is come out and make a credible case that he, that he believes it, that he believes that Barack Obama has grown in his role as a candidate, that he has the judgment um, and uh, the experience to be president, to be a good commander-in-chief, that he's made some tough calls, that he's made the right calls. I, I, I Look, I think if he can do that, it, it, that, that will be a terrific uh, end to the Clinton's uh, chapter of this convention. Look, the Clinton piece has been a very big piece of this so far, but I, Hillary pulled hers off with a plum. I'm not sure everybody in the NBC broadcast booths believed Hillary Clinton when she said she wanted her name put into a roll call so for, to, to be cathartic. I think it was absolutely cathartic here this afternoon. And when you saw Nancy Pelosi ask the delegates to acclaim her, to, to acclaim Obama as the nominee, and the enthusiasm with, with which this room said, I, it was remarkable. And I think it, it re, you know, I think it was a testament to her judgment that that's what her delegates needed, and we're now past that. The piece that remains to be seen is how does Bill Clinton put the exclamation point on the end of the Clinton story here in Denver. And, and the motive issue, we talked about this all day yesterday. I had a minority opinion. I'm not going to boast about being right because I think it was just common sense. It wasn't any kind of insight. But at bottom line here, the bottom line of bottom lines for both of these Clintons is that they have to live in this country for the next four years as well. And never mind nice. the 2012 nomination, and never mind the 20... We're just hoping we can get this country to 2012. Is that Bill Clinton's yeah. bottom line of bottom lines? Yeah, and 
I think when Hillary Clinton last night talked about um, the soldier who couldn't get health care and the, you know, the single mother with children who's fighting cancer and the, um, you know, all the people who feel invisible, I think she really reminded people that she went out into the country and connected with those people and she got into those races and I believe it because she cared about those people and so how can she turn her back on what's in their best best interest because she didn't win the nomination. So I think, you know, after November, we'll see what happens. But between now and November, I really believe that Hillary Clinton and I hope Bill Clinton will be very much focused on getting Barack Obama elected because I know they believe that's in the country's best interest. Well, Diddy, I know you think I'm recalcitrant, but I do believe what you say now. I now believe what you said before. I now believe yeah. that this whole convention is has been, to use your word, cathartic. I do believe people want to be visible who have felt that they were invisible. I do believe that right. people that fail and still feel to some extent they're lacking in the respect they deserve want more of it. So you're right. Diddy Myers, thank you. Thank you. Up next, Nora O'Donnell on our panel, and we get ready for President Clinton's speech coming at the top of the hour. This is MSNBC's continuing coverage of the Democratic Convention, live from Denver. join you from Denver with MSNBC's coverage of day three of the Democratic Convention. Former President Clinton due to speak at the top of the hour. And uh, let's check back in with Nora O'Donnell and the panel. All right, Chris and Keith, thank you. And now Rachel Maddow joins us. Great to have you on. And the clock is ticking, like eight minutes now, until we hear from President Bill Clinton. We're not going to try and psychoanalyze too much, Rachel, but what does he need to say tonight? I frankly feel like the unity issue, surprisingly enough, was settled last night. And when Bill Clinton speaks tonight, what we're going to be waiting to find out is not whether or not the issues between the Clinton camp and the Obama camp have been settled. I feel like, uh, and it surprised me maybe more than anybody, that that issue is done as of last night, or at least as of this morning when all the delegations met to talk about their plans for today. And so the question is, how, Senator, how President Clinton will signal the choice between Barack Obama and John McCain to the rest of the country. He is an elder statesman. He does represent the Democratic Party more than anybody else in this country other than Senator Obama right now. And people are going to be waiting to find out how he sees that choice. And, you know, Bill Clinton's always a wild card. We're all going to be on the edge of our seats. And then, Pat, what about, what does Bill Clinton need to say in terms of experience? Does he need to come out and say, essentially, that Barack Obama is ready on day one? Um, he needs to validate Barack Obama. There's no question about it. The first thing he needs to do is make sure that you cannot get that piece of rice paper between him and Barack Obama, so he's going to endorse him right up front. Secondly, I think he's going to defend, justifiably, his economic record, which was excellent, and he's going to answer that I was a transformational president. I think he's going to go after John McCain. I think he's going to do it on the economy. I think he'll do it. I think he will do it. He will do it better than Hillary two, Clinton did two it. Two key questions. Will he keep it to 10 minutes, which he's supposed okay, to? No. <laughs> uh, that's easy. Uh, but I think what he will do, and, it, and it's very important, is the validation Pat was talking about, answering the 3 a.m. question, saying yeah. this man is ready to be president on day one. That's what Bill Clinton, I think, will do tonight. And I think that's the most, most helpful thing he can do for the Obama candidacy. And as we await for President Bill Clinton to take the stage and make uh, this speech tonight, I think one of the things we've talked about, too, is his competitive spirit. The reviews were good for Hillary Clinton's speech last night. You called it a turning point. Uh, we're going to have much more. I'm going to send it back to Chris and Keith because Bill Clinton is about, expected just about to address uh, this Democratic Party. Back to you guys. Thank you. When we come back, former President Bill Clinton. Back in 
Denver and night three of the Democratic National Convention, and the room is a buzz again. Former President Bill Clinton will be taking to that podium in a matter of minutes at most. Keith Olbermann alongside Chris Matthews here in Denver. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine how he'll do this, and yet I suspect he will. Well, it could be 10 minutes to rock the world because, uh, let's face it, this has been the big question. Can the party unite? Can Bill and Hillary Clinton bring it together? No one thought that, and do think today, that Barack Obama can do it by himself. He can appeal for unity, but he's the one that needs it. He's the supplicant. Someone has to offer it up. Someone has to deliver it. Uh, there you see Senator Clinton, who did it last night, and her daughter. Now the introduction of President Clinton. Hello, my name is Kendrick Meek, and I'm proud to represent South Florida in the U.S. Congress. I'm also proud to introduce my good friend, the 42nd President of the United States, Bill Clinton. His two terms as president show that when a Democrat is in, in charge of our country and what America can accomplish when a Democrat is in the White House is a wonderful thing. President Clinton presided over the longest economic expansion in U.S. history, more than 22 million new jobs, the lowest unemployment rate in 40 years, the lowest poverty rate in 20 years, the lowest crime rate in 26 years, and the highest home ownership in U.S. history. He did all of this while inheriting a deficit from the previous president and leaving a record surplus for the president we have now. As Commander-in-Chief, President Bill Clinton presided over the military to be able to prepare it, to be able to win wars, at the same time making the peace in Africa, Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and he left a legacy of national strength and common national purpose on which President Barack Obama is going to rebuild. My fellow Americans, I give you one of the greatest presidents of the United States of America, William Jefferson Clinton. Come on. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here tonight. Sit down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honored to be here tonight. Please stop. Thank you. Please stop. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Please sit. Please sit. You know, I uh, I love this, <laughs> and I thank you. But we have important work to do tonight. I am here first to support Barack Obama. And second, and second, I'm here to warm up the crowd for Joe Biden. Though, as you will soon see, he doesn't need any help from me. I love Joe Biden, and America will too. What a year we Democrats have had. The primary began with an all-star lineup, and it came down to two remarkable Americans locked in a hard-fought contest right to the very end. That campaign generated so much heat, it increased global warming. <laughs> now, in the end, my candidate didn't win. But I'm really proud of the campaign she ran. I am proud that she never quit on the people she stood up for, on the changes she pushed for, on the future she wanted for all our children. And I'm grateful for the chance Chelsea and I had to go all over America to tell people about the person we know and love. Now, I am not so grateful for the chance to speak in the wake of Hillary's magnificent speech last night. <laughs> but I'll do the best I can. Last night, Hillary told us in no uncertain terms that she is going to do everything she can to elect Barack Obama. That makes two of us. Actually, that makes 18 million of us. Because, like Hillary, I want all of you who supported her to vote for Barack Obama in November. And, here's why. And I have the privilege of speaking here, thanks to you, from a perspective that no other American Democrat except President Carter can offer. Our, our nation is in trouble on two fronts. The American dream is under siege at home, and America's leadership in the world has been weakened. Middle-class and low-income Americans are hurting, with incomes declining, job losses, poverty and inequality rising, mortgage foreclosures and credit card debt increasing, health care coverage disappearing, and a very big spike in the cost of food, utilities, and gasoline. And our position in the world has been weakened by too much unilateralism and too little cooperation. 
by a, by a perilous dependence on imported oil, by a refusal to lead on global warming, by a growing indebtedness and a dependence on foreign lenders, by a severely burdened military, by a backsliding on global nonproliferation and arms control agreements, and by a failure to consistently use the power of diplomacy from the Middle East to Africa to Latin America to Central and Eastern Europe. <laughs> Clearly, the job of the next president is to rebuild the American dream and to restore American leadership in the world. And here's what I have to say about that. Everything I learned in my eight years as president and in the work I have done since in America and across the globe has convinced me that Barack Obama is the man for this job. He has a remarkable ability to inspire people, to raise our hopes and rally us to high purpose. He has the intelligence and curiosity every successful president needs. His policies on the economy, on taxes, on health care, on energy are far superior to the Republican alternatives. He has shown, he has shown a clear grasp of foreign policy and national security challenges and a firm commitment to rebuild our badly strained military. His family heritage and his life experiences have given him a unique capacity to lead our increasingly diverse nation in an ever more interdependent world. The long, hard primary tested and strengthened him. And in his first presidential decision, the selection of a running mate, he hit it out of the park. With Joe Biden's experience and wisdom, supporting Barack Obama's proven understanding, instincts, and insight. America will have the national security leadership we need. And so, my fellow Democrats, I say to you, Barack Obama is ready to lead America and to restore American leadership in the world. Barack Obama is ready to honor the oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Barack Obama is ready to be President of the United States. President, he will work for an America with more partners and fewer adversaries. He will rebuild our freight alliances and revitalize the international institutions which help to share the cost of the world's problems and to leverage the power of our influence. He will put us back in the forefront of the world's fight against global warming and the fight to reduce nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. He will continue and enhance our nation's commendable global leadership in an area in which I am deeply involved, the fight against AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, including, including, and this is very important, a renewal of the battle against HIV and AIDS here at home.
A President Obama will choose diplomacy first and military force as a last resort. But in a world troubled by terror, by trafficking in weapons, drugs, and people, by human rights abuses of the most awful kind, by other threats to our security, our interests, and our values. When he cannot convert adversaries into partners, he will stand up to them. <laughs> Barack Obama also will not allow the world's problems to obscure its opportunities. Everywhere, in rich and poor countries alike, Hard-working people need good jobs, secure, affordable health care, food, and energy, quality education for their children, and economically beneficial ways to fight global warming. These challenges cry out for American ideas and American innovation. When Barack Obama unleashes them, America will save lives, win new allies, open new markets, and create wonderful new jobs for our own people. Most important of all, Barack Obama knows that America cannot be strong abroad unless we are first strong at home. People the world over have always been more impressed by the power of our example than by the example of our power. the example the Republicans have set. In this decade, American workers have consistently given us rising productivity. That means year after year they work harder and produce more. Now what did they get in return? Declining wages, less than one-fourth as many new jobs as in the previous eight years, smaller health care and pension benefits, rising poverty, and the biggest increase in income inequality since the 1920s. American families, by the millions, are struggling with soaring health care costs and declining coverage. I will never forget the parents of children with autism and other serious conditions who told me on the campaign trail that they couldn't afford health care and couldn't qualify their children for Medicaid unless they quit work and starved or got a divorce. Are these the family values the Republicans are so proud of? What about the military families pushed to the breaking point by multiple, multiple deployments? What about the assault on science and the defense of torture? What about the war on unions and the unlimited favors for the well-connected? And what about Katrina and cronyism? Um, my fellow Democrats, America can do better than that. And Barack Obama will do better than that. Wait a minute. But first, Yes, he can, but first, we have to elect him.
The choice is clear. The Republicans in a few days will nominate a good man who has served our country heroically and who suffered terribly in a Vietnamese prison camp. He loves his country every bit as much as we do. As a senator, he has shown his independence of right-wing orthodoxy on some very important issues. But on the two great questions of this election, how to rebuild the American dream and how to restore America's leadership in the world, he still embraces the extreme philosophy that has defined his party for more than 25 years. And it is, to be fair to all the Americans who aren't as hardcore Democrats as we, it's a philosophy the American people never actually had a chance to see in action fully until 2001, when the Republicans finally gained control of both the White House and the Congress. Then we saw what would happen to America if the policies they had talked about for decades actually were implemented. And look what happened. They took us from record surpluses to an exploding debt, from over 22 million new jobs to just 5 million, from increasing working families' incomes to nearly $7,500 a year to a decline of more than $2,000 a year, from almost 8 million Americans lifted out of poverty to more than five and a half million driven into poverty and millions more losing their health insurance. Now, in spite of all this evidence, their candidate is actually promising more of the same. <laughs> Think about it. More tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans that will swell the deficit, increase inequality, and weaken the economy. More band-aids for health care that will enrich insurance companies, impoverish families, and increase the number of uninsured. More going it alone in the world instead of building the shared responsibilities and shared opportunities necessary to advance our security and restore our influence. They actually want us to reward them for the last eight years by giving them four more. Let's send them a message that will echo from the Rockies all across America. A simple message. Thanks, but no thanks. In this case, in this case, the third time is not the charm. My My fellow Democrats, 16 years ago, you gave me the profound honor to lead our party to victory and to lead our nation to a new era of peace and broadly shared prosperity. Together, we prevailed in a hard campaign in which the Republicans said, I was too young and too inexperienced to be Commander-in-Chief. <laughs> Sound familiar? It didn't work in 1992 because we were on the right side of history. And it will not work in 2008 because Barack Obama is on the right side of history. Now, Senator Obama's life is a 21st century incarnation of the old-fashioned American dream. His achievements are proof of our continuing progress toward the more perfect union of our founders' dreams. The values of freedom and equal opportunity, which have given him his historic chance, will drive him as president to give all Americans, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or disability, their chance to build a decent life 
and to show our humanity as well as our strength to the world. We see that humanity, that strength, and our nation's future in Barack and Michelle Obama and their beautiful children. We see them reinforced by the partnership with Joe Biden, his fabulous wife, Jill, a wonderful teacher, and their family. Barack Obama will lead us away from the division and fear of the last eight years back to unity and hope. So, if, like me, you believe America must always be a place called hope, then join Hillary and Chelsea and me in making Barack Obama the next president of the United States. Thank you and God bless you. Clinton and the ready, ready, ready speech. If anybody could roll back that theme from the primary season, he could do it. I think he just did. The speech had snap, and I thought the best line was the one that had the most snap, which was Hillary told us in no uncertain terms that she'll do everything she can to elect Barack Obama. That makes two of us. And adding then to it, actually, that makes 18 million of us. Again, reinforcing last night's message that if you supported, if you supported his wife in the primary season, if you were ready to cast your vote for her to be president of the United States, it follows as the night, the day you must cast your vote for Obama. And to hear him say it, and to hear him say it with conviction and with 100% of the fastball. Right. For all the commentary, the most disturbing part of the last eight months had not been what he said, but a sense that maybe he didn't have that full grasp of the political sphere anymore. I think he put that to, to, to bed tonight. I think he, he buried that premise. That was a superb speech, again, superbly delivered. Remember, we were worried or they, the, the Obama camp and the Clinton camp were both worried he might be booed coming out. Right. Instead, he got three and a half minutes of applause before they let him talk. And I think he gave the keynote point here. Again, I believe politics must be aggressive to be successful. It must be negative in many cases, especially when you're trying to take power back, which is what they're trying to do. Listen to this line. This is the Republican. This is his description of the other team. They want us to reward them for the last eight years by giving them four more. Let's send them a message that will echo from the Rockies all across America. Thanks, but no thanks. In this case, the third time is not the charm. That's what people like to hear, like they like to hear last night about the Twin Cities and the fact that uh, McCain and Bush are twins. They love that line that you liked as well about the side, the uh, sidekick, yes. not the maverick. I, I, the, 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 Bob Casey I think I agree with uh, Pat Buchanan on this one point. This, this uh, convention needs more of that spark, more of that snap. It's beginning to get it. And please notice also that in there amid the snappy lines, the ones that you, you correctly assess are necessary and useful and you'll carry away, there was also at least one shot towards John McCain's solar plexus. On the two great questions of this election, how to rebuild the American dream and how to restore America's leadership in the world, he, McCain, still embraces the extreme philosophy, which has defined his party for more than 25 years. He called John McCain and the Republicans extremists. And as we sit around saying, where is the red meat? It was hidden in there, but that's kind of the attitude that is reflective of much of the Democratic campaign at the grassroots level. And that's what they wanted to hear. And they heard it from a man who had been perceived until recently as being perhaps not fully engaged in this. Right. And again, I think he put that as far to bed as it was possible to be put. Let's go into the Pepsi Center. Two people who saw this firsthand without the intervention of television, our, C, our special correspondent Tom Brokaw and our political director Chuck Todd. Tom, uh, overall picture on the arc of this speech. 
Uh, Elvis was back in the hall tonight. Uh, it was probably not his <laughs> greatest performance in terms of sheer poetry. It was kind of painting by the numbers by Bill Clinton's standards. He knew all the markers that he had to hit, and he hit them repeatedly. As you indicated, Keith, I think uh, uh, with such great insight. And the fact is that the theme here was he's ready, he's ready, he's ready. He's ready to be commander in chief. They said the same thing about me and it worked out fine for the eight years that I was there. Uh, I, I was not surprised by this performance tonight. I don't think Chuck was either. No, it was, he definitely seemed to embrace his role as being the patriarch of the Democratic Party. It was almost as he's saying, look, let me tell you about my disciple, Barack Obama. The only thing I think Republicans will jump on, I thought, was when he said, with Joe Biden's experience and wisdom, supporting Barack Obama's proven understanding. This has been a, a theme the Republicans have been trying to jump on, which is Obama's trying to borrow Biden's experience in order to sell himself. And, and in some ways, this is the only line I thought that jumped out at me that said, all right, the McCain campaign's gonna use that line to say, see, he's trying to, this is more proof. Even Bill Clinton thinks that uh, Obama's trying to borrow somebody else's experience and doesn't have the experience on his own. But I'll say the most powerful graph, I think, was when he compared himself in 1992 to Obama yep. in 08. And, and what I find interesting about it is he was re Bill Clinton was repeatedly asked this question about 92 uh, because Bill Clinton is actually younger, was younger in 92 than Barack Obama is now. And at the time when he was asked that, he said, well, no, 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 I was governor for over a decade. I had dealt with all these things. So you could just tell time heals all wounds and past statements are past statements. But one point you made is vitally important about the references to Biden, Chuck. Uh, there, there has to be a rationale if you're Bill Clinton and you want people to believe that this is what you believe. You can't just come out and say, hey, I changed my mind. Vote right. for him. There has to be some evolution that you saw in him that you can then say created this evolution in your chain of thought. And, and maybe it was worth the sacrifice of putting that out there for the Republicans to chew on if it's necessary, to be able to say he, the primary tested him and the Biden choice was his first presidential decision and he hit it out of the park. You've got to provide no. the rationale. Was that not the rationale? No doubt. I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. Absolutely. He was making that case. It was almost prosecutorial and sort of laying out the argument as to how Bill Clinton got to the decision that he was comfortable with Barack Obama as president. But still, that will be the line, I think, that they use uh, to, to try to tweak Obama here a little bit. But overall, again, it was, a, it was a patriarchal speech, and I think Tom was right. He didn't try to overshadow Hillary, and it, he didn't try to make it a stem winder. He just sort of enjoyed the moment. I would also uh, suggest, Keith, that there may be a counterpunch coming for the Democrats, because all the indications are, at this point at least, that uh, Senator McCain will try to pick somebody who can help him with the economy. Right. So they'll come back to him on that and say, what's more important to you? And what Bill Clinton did here was twin up understanding, as he put it, with the skills of the national security area. They've got John McCain on the record saying, I don't know much about the economy. And if he goes to somebody like Mitt Romney, all the obvious conclusions will be he had to go there because he just doesn't know enough about the economy which still registers with the American voters as the number one issue. And Keith, we are 48 hours from McCain doing this pick. The New York Times already out with a story this morning saying that the short list is what we think it is yeah. uh, of Romney, Tim Pawlenty, and may maybe Joe Lieberman, and a fourth name that's being thrown out there, Kay Bailey Hutchison of Texas, as sort of a wow. surprise possibility. But it, then again, there's a lot of folks knocking it down already. Hutchison and McCain never have been two senators that have gotten along, but again, the idea of McCain picking a woman because of the popularity of Hillary Clinton has to be tempting to some Republicans, and that may be why that rumor's out there. Uh, Tom, first, what did you make of the acknowledgement of the service of uh, John McCain in, in very glowing terms? Well, uh, look, for Bill Clinton, uh, and, and for anyone in the Democratic Party for that matter, it's a very tricky case taking on John McCain and trying to rough him up. When John McCain was sitting in a prison in Hanoi, Bill Clinton was writing letters to his ROTC commander 
and trying to get out of the draft, uh, which he did successfully. It was an issue that he was really able to manage when he was running for president. But at the same time, that's still a very short fuse in America, as you know, Chris. And there is a real fondness between the McCains and the Clinton. You can't forget that. Uh, Senator Clinton and Senator McCain made a number of overseas trips together and very famously were doing shots together when they were up looking at uh, icebergs in Norway somewhere. So, but I think especially you have to be careful about how you go after John McCain because of that Vietnam experience. Jim Webb has written in his latest book, A Time to Fight, and repeated to me again just yesterday, Democratic Party still has a long way to go to win the confidence of Vietnam veterans. And they, they don't want to squander that here in the big hall. Tom Brokaw, Chuck Todd inside that big hall. Thank you both. Coming up, the reaction from our own Rachel Maddow, plus David Gregory and Andrea Mitchell on the convention floor. We now await Joe Biden's speech about an hour from now. Bill Clinton's is in the books. Barack Obama is ready to lead America and restore American leadership in the world, ready to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Barack Obama is ready to be President of the United States. You're watching MSNBC's live coverage of the Democratic National Convention. ...in the world, and we must use all the weapons in our arsenal, above all, our values. President Obama and Vice President Biden will shut down... I have known and been friends with John McCain for almost 22 years. But every day now, I learn something new about candidate McCain. To those who still believe in the myth of a maverick instead of the reality of a politician, I say, let's compare Senator McCain to candidate McCain. Candidate McCain now supports the very wartime tax cuts that Senator McCain once called irresponsible. Candidate McCain criticizes Senator McCain's own climate change bill. Candidate McCain says he would vote against the immigration bill that Senator McCain wrote. Are you kidding me, folks? about being for it before you're against it. Let me tell you, let me tell you, before he ever debates Barack Obama, John McCain should finish the debate with himself. And what's more, Senator McCain, who once railed against the smears of Karl Rove when he was the target, has morphed into candidate McCain, who is using the same Rove tactics, the same Rove staff, the same old politics of fear and spear. Well, not this year, not this time. The Rove McCain tactics are old and outworn, and America will reject them in 2008. So remember. The Mojus coming from John Kerry, perhaps a little late for his own candidacy, but uh, indeed perhaps in time for Barack Obama. That was moments ago as he addressed the Democratic Convention and got one of the loudest cheers throughout the entire event so far. We rejoin you from Denver. Rachel Maddow, host of our new 9 p.m. Eastern Hour on MSNBC, joins us now. And a grateful nation says howdy. Related to all of these people. Yeah, so, very good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, they want, apparently, they want to hear what you have to say about this. So tell me what you have to say about President Clinton's speech and its relative effectiveness. Well, we knew that Bill Clinton would offer a full throated endorsement of Barack Obama, and he did. I mean, when he said, Everything I learned in my eight years as president and in the work I've done since in America and across the globe has convinced me that Barack Obama is the man for this job. You kind of can't get any more full-throated than that. But what he did tonight beyond that is that he reminded every Democrat in the country that Bill Clinton knows how to beat Republicans in elections. And if you were looking for red meat, it does not get more rare than this. Finally, somebody stood up there at that podium and said, torture, yep. Katrina cronyism, 
the most unequal America we have had since the 1920s, to finally nail the Bush legacy uh, of the past eight years. And sure, he has the right to compare it to the, pre the eight years that preceded it, but to go there over and over and over again, to make the, the, the red meat that red here, shows, I think, it's his, he's trying to lead by example here, trying to say, this is how you'll beat these guys. What about the war on unions and the unlimited favors for the well-connected, which got a rousing response from that crowd there, and the one here, and the point being of all this, I suppose, that it, there is seems to be something of a thematic thread going through the entire convention, starting with, with Teddy Kennedy on Monday night and passing all the way through, through Hillary Clinton last night, Senator Clinton tonight, and Joe Biden coming up after the top of the hour, where we're expecting some serious uh, body work with the punching against John McCain. They seem to be building towards a big, giant uh, nose thumbing, to be polite about it, towards the Republicans. Is it, is it satisfactory? Is it enough to galvanize the anger in the country towards the Bush administration and focus it against the McCain candidacy? Well, I think it is a, it's an attempt to connect with the country that already feels that way. I mean, 80% of the country thinks we're on the wrong track. George Bush's approval ratings are so low they're approaching Cheney's, and that's bad. At the de if the Democrats can identify themselves as the people who get what Americans are so mad about, the, country, the, 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 the party that, that understands that th what has been going on is wrong, is not the future of America, it is a past that we're going to need to repair and move on from, then Barack Obama as the standard bearer is, is, is important and is nice, but the Democratic Party also brands itself as the party of a, a very dissatisfied satisfied country. So that's why you can be negative. When the country feels this negative, it's not discordant for a party convention to have a lot of negative words coming from the podium. It actually ought to resonate with the American public if you believe the polls about what the American people say. Rachel, let's talk about the campaign from now on involving uh, former President Boy, uh, uh, Clinton. It seems to me, and I know I'm not in this business, but if I were to choreograph it now, I'd put those two men on the road together, Barack and the former president. I'd get them out there almost like a buddy film. I'd get them going around even kidding with each other, showing their comfort with each other, the white guy and the black guy, if you will, the Hillary guy and the Barack guy, and show them out there comfortably. Because I think it's so important for Barack to reach people he can't reach, which are the people in the rural areas, the white people, the people who are culturally more conservative. I think, that's, I think that that's a strategy that they're going to be trying to pursue. We don't know, in terms of the characters and the personalities involved here, how much they're going to want to be out there. We don't know if there's going to be resentment about, about uh, spotlight stealing uh, among these huge characters. There aren't shared huge characters like that on the Republican side that they have to fight about. Nobody's going to expect George Bush to be out there campaigning for them. I mean, I, I could imagine Senator Clinton and Joe Biden doing a huge event in Scranton. You know, I can imagine Joe, I can imagine President President Clinton and Barack Obama going anywhere in the world together and it being um, almost overwhelming in terms of its political impact. We don't know. We're so fascinated with the interpersonal drama here. We don't really know what limits they might have set interpersonally, but I think in terms of political, effect, political effectiveness, the unity question is settled. It's just strategy now. I have a question that pertains more to the man who's speaking right now, John Kerry, than it does to Bill Clinton. John Kerry just got off the, the, the best line, of, maybe one of the best lines of the convention here about be talking about being uh, 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 for it before you were against it, turning that phrase from 2004 back on the Republicans. We saw Al Gore in the years after his campaign uh, succeed by being absolute and fervent and himself. Kerry seems to have been entirely a different person than he was in 2004. Is there instruction? Between those two men and what we just heard Bill Clinton say, is there instruction for how and how far Barack Obama should go about his campaign? I think there is specific instruction about how to talk about John McCain in a way that the country will not rebel against because of what John McCain's POW service means to sort of his political definition. You can acknowledge his service. You cannot talk about his personal life in a way that is slimy or that's going to turn people off from you. But you can also talk about, I mean, as Joe Biden or John Kerry can do, having spent decades in the Senate with this man and having seen the guy who they thought was an honorable politician, an honorable American leader turn into an almost unrecognizable John McCain in the candidate that he is today. The way that John McCain is running his campaign, who he's got surrounding him, the flip-flop on the, all the major positions, on, on so many of the major positions that defined him as a popular Republican in the country, country at large, those are gone. 
And 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 those that's the way to go after McCain. And actually, that's one of the great reasons that Biden is a good pick. Sure, Biden takes away the ability of the Obama campaign to say, oh, John McCain, he's been in Washington for 26 years. Can't really say that when Biden's been there longer. But Biden can say, I used to know John McCain. I don't know him anymore. I don't recognize candidate McCain and the guy who's been my friend for decades. You heard John Kerry say some of that tonight, and I don't think that can be taken on as the low road. Right. I, I, I know John McCain and you, sir, are not John McCain anymore. <laughs> that would work. Uh, Rachel Maddow work. at uh, T minus 12 days. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. David Gregory now joins us from the convention floor inside the Pepsi Center. David. Thanks, Chris. I'm here with Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, senior senator, uh, senator from Illinois. An important night for you to have uh, Barack Obama be almost officially the nominee. Let's talk about President Clinton. What strikes me about it is that at its core, it was an attempt to respond not to the attacks of Obama's Republican critics, but the attacks that came from Bill and Hillary Clinton, that electing Barack Obama would be a roll of the dice, that effectively he wasn't ready to be president. Was this speech enough to walk those criticisms back? I think it was. I think it was strong and unconditional. And many of the same arguments in the primary that didn't work are being resurrected again by the McCain campaign. I think what Bill Clinton did today was to not only make it clear that he is supporting Barack Obama, but he believes that those charges being thrown at him by the Republicans are not going to resonate. The American people can see in the success of Bill Clinton's presidency that the charges of youth and inexperience don't go too far. And it was an intensely personal moment for Bill Clinton to adopt the argument that Adeem Barack Obama has used, which is that they used to say the same things about exactly. Bill Clinton. He spoke about Barack Obama in a more personal way, talked about his instincts, his understanding, his incisiveness, frankly, even more personally than Hillary Clinton did last night. Well, I think it's um, it's an interesting thing to try to analyze the Clintons and their approach. But let's do. Well, let's do it for a minute. And I will just tell you, as a strong supporter of uh, Barack Obama, one of the earliest, and as a good friend of Hillary Clinton, we couldn't have asked for more last night. And there was a question tonight, well, how far will Bill Clinton go? We couldn't have asked for more from Bill Clinton. He's made it clear that when it comes to the choice in this election, it's a clear choice. And what I think what he, he did toward the end there was go through the expected litany of what has happened the last eight years from what he left behind in the eight years of his presidency. But Senator, it's one thing to rally the faithful here and say, okay, I'm on board, I'm gonna give fulsome support to Senator Obama. It's another thing for Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton to say to their supporters, white working class voters in important parts of this country, independent voters in the Rocky Mountain West and Colorado and beyond, hey, Barack Obama's okay. Because a lot of the questions will be, well, what makes you all of a sudden comfortable with them when it was so clear that, that you were not in a tough primary battle that was in many ways like a real bad argument between friends or family. You can say certain things that are not so easy to take back. But I can tell you that the history, the past, the politics of the last several months, we're really not going to, I think, determine what's going to happen in the next two months. In the next two months, we're going to focus on the real campaign issues. And a reminder, too, we're political animals. You on the media side, me on the political side, and most people aren't. You know, they focus their lives on the ordinary course of events, getting the kids ready for school, paying for gasoline. Now they're going to focus on politics. And I don't think the arguments of the past primaries are really going to decide their votes. I know this is a night of a lot of personal pride for you and because of your support of Senator Obama. Thanks for spending time with us. Good to be with you. Okay. Back to you guys outside. David Gregory, many thanks uh, with Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois on the uh, floor of the Pepsi Center. When we come back, uh, we'll begin the countdown to the speech from the vice presidential nominee. In fact, see the nomination of Joe Biden for vice president of the United States as our coverage continues live from Denver, Colorado. in Denver, Colorado. After Bill Clinton's speech, let's go inside the Pepsi Center. Andrea Mitchell in the Florida delegation with reaction. Andrea? Keith, I'm here with Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the Congresswoman, who's a strong Clinton supporter and gave one of the seconding nominating speeches of Barack Obama as Glassnose breaks out all over the floor. <laughs> uh, here we are. Bill Clinton tonight, did he do enough to bring all of those reluctant voters in Florida, those Clinton supporters, over? He did. He laid out just how much is at stake and helped lay the groundwork for the vision that Barack Obama will talk about 
to the country tomorrow night. It, he left he left absolutely no doubt about where he would be. Hillary did the same thing last night, and we're going to be fired up and ready to go for the rest of the general election cycle. And does this make it easier for you in selling your people back home? It really does. We have President Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, all of whom are wildly popular in my home state, and they are going to be a one, two, three punch all across our state to make sure we can turn Florida blue. Briefly, can Barack Obama win Florida? Barack Obama will win Florida. It's one of the 18 battleground states. They're going to have an unprecedented amount of resources in our state, grassroots, second to none. We are going to win Florida on November 4th. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, one of the rising stars of the Democratic Party. Thank, Thank you Debbie. very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Back to you, Keith. Andrea Mitchell inside the Pepsi Center. Thank you very much. All right, in the next hour, the final big speech of this third night of the Democratic Convention. As the vice presidential nominee is nominated, Joe Biden will take to the stage and has, uh, we believe, some very strong words for the Republican Party and uh, some very strong words, of course, on behalf of Barack Obama. Our coverage of the third night of the Democratic National Convention 2008 continues from Denver right after this.